And we've watched this mystery of iniquity in our time. For at least the last 100 years, billionaire bankers and businessmen have been trying to sell the world on a one world government. After World War I, they tried to establish the League of Nations, and that failed. And then after World War II, they established the United Nations and have dumped billions of dollars into it trying to build their new world order. And we're almost there. So do I think that the coronavirus is a sign of the end of the world? I don't think so. But I do think this COVID-19 is a drill. It's a simulation. It's a dress rehearsal, if you will, to work out the bugs and get all the nations prepared for this final world government. For the last three months, we've watched our globalist leaders manipulate us with the Marxist revolutionary technique known as the Hegelian dialectic. It's a very complicated philosophical thing, but it can actually be salted down to about three points. And that is called problem, reaction, solution. The way you change cultures is using problem, reaction, solution. So these globalists, they cause a problem, be it terrorism or pandemic or global warming or whatever they want to come up with. And then they wait for our reaction. Our reaction as people tends to be the same. Oh no, we're all going to die. Somebody do something. And then they have the solution, a prepackaged, ready for us, usually involves more government control of our lives. So let's look at the timetable a little bit. Sometimes it gets blurred with our 24-hour uh, news cycles that go through, but let's look back at the timeline and see the changes that have occurred in the last couple of years that's brought about our current predicament, which for us began on March 15th when President Trump declared a state of emergency for coronavirus. Three years ago, November the 8th, 2016, Donald Trump shocked the world by winning the presidency of the United States of America. He won this election by promising to make America great again, to put a stop to the globalist agenda, to close our borders, and to quit paying all the bills for United Nations and NATO. Also to stop uh, this man-made global climate change hoax and to stop the one-sided trade deals. He said, I want international trade, but it needs to be fair trade, not with America always being on the other end of the hook there. So once he started all this, immediately the globalist billionaire banking and business class turned on him. The press attacked him. Democrat politicians and never Trump Republicans began trying to impeach him. That went on for about three years. And then once that failed, the next move was coronavirus. Now in the past, it was usually David Rockefeller who was pulling the strings on, around the world on these globalist movements, but he died in March 2017, we never did think he would, but he died in March 2017 at 101 years old. And of course, then there's George Soros. He always gets the blame. He's 90 years old. Right now, he's not having much to say, but he is heavily invested in pharmaceuticals. And so it appears that Bill Gates is taking the lead of this billionaire's club move toward a one world order. Uh, one of the other elder statesmen of this bunch is Henry Kissinger, who is now 97 years old. And ever since I was a little kid, Henry Kissinger's been on the radio and on the TV talking about his new world order. Anyhow, he wrote an op-ed piece on April the 3rd rejoicing about how this new world order would lead us to, how this coronavirus would lead us to this new world order. So he is so proud of Bill Gates, he said there. So apparently Bill Gates is the anointed one. He is one of the richest globalists today. He's co-founder of Microsoft, who is now working to give away his nearly $100 billion fortune through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His pet projects are population control and vaccinations. His father was a board member for the abortion provider Planned Parenthood, who helped young Bill understand as he grew up the need for global birth control to save the planet. Vaccinations, strangely, by Bill, are considered a subset of population control. Bill has this theory that if less babies died in infancy, then parents will want fewer children. And so he works all this population control and vaccinations through something called the Good Club. You can look it up on the internet. The Good Club is made up of other globalist billionaires like George Soros, Warren Buffett, Oprah Winfrey, uh, the Rockefeller family, uh, the Ted Turner Foundation, etc. Two years ago, on January the 17th of 2017, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, for those of you who's not aware of what goes on in Davos, Davos, they have this January meeting every year where 3,000 of the world's wealthiest people gather every year to figure out how to rule the world. 
Bill Gates, back in 2017, initiated a new working group called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. It's a collaboration of the Gates Foundation, the governments of Norway, India, Japan, and Germany, and two big pharmaceutical companies called Inovio and Moderna. They also included DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as the mad scientist of the Department of Defense. It also included the Army, U.S. Army's Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, that's the mad scientists of the Army, that work out of Fort Detrick, Maryland. This CEPI began working on the next epidemic in 2017. Also at Davos, Gates began working on a Netflix video called Pandemic. Now, as y'all all, all know, I don't watch movies, but maybe I should have watched this one. It was released in November of last year. The plot of the movie was a coronavirus that originated in a wet market in China, leaving millions of people dead. Wow, what do you think? Is that a coincidence? Is Bill Gates a prophet? Or is it a plan? Last fall, October the 18th, 2019, there was a pandemic exercise called Event 201 at Johns Hopkins University. The exercise was conducted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and Michael Bloomberg's School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. And yes, that's the same Michael Bloomberg that just tried to run against, Bill, uh, against Donald Trump for President of the United States. The pandemic simulation predicted that the coronavirus would have the same kill rate as the Spanish flu of 1918, which caused around 65 million deaths worldwide in an 18-month period. It's also interesting to note that Dr. George Fugao, the director of the Chinese Centers for Disease Control, was involved in the simulation. At the same time, at the very same day, October the 18th and lasted through the 27th, the World Military Games were being held of all places in Wuhan, China. You had 10,000 athletes from 110 countries. Uh, the United States delegation was about 300 people. Two months later, January the 7th, China reports the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan. January the 21st through the 24th was the 2020 annual World Economic Forum gathering in Davos. So the rich guys were back in Davos again in January of this year. And Bill Gates and his CPI, uh, CEPI that I just announced, they announced a coronavirus vaccine program with partnerships including Inovio and Moderna, and the United States National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is led by none other than Dr. Tony Fossey, who is now the chief medical advisor to President Trump, who you see on TV in these daily briefings that we're getting. He's an interesting character because he wrote in March in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine that this coronavirus was gonna be a nothing, it was gonna be similar to the seasonal flu. But when he went, to went in front of the television cameras, he told American people this coronavirus is 10 times worse than the seasonal flu, may kill 2 million Americans if we do nothing. It still may kill 200,000 Americans even if we shut down the country and shelter in place. There's no known vaccine, he said, and it's going to take 12 to 18 months to get a vaccine even ready for trials. And of course, the question is, where did Dr. Fossey get all those numbers? Where did he get the model of the 2 million people and 200,000 people? Well, it turns out that came out of the University of Washington the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Before the thing was over in Switzerland, we had something going on at the United States Capitol. On January the 24th, the United States House of Representatives began drafting a coronavirus stimulus bill called the CARES Act. Yes, the money that you got this past week and deposited into your account actually started the legislative process on January the 24th, which as Americans, we didn't even know there was such a thing as a coronavirus till March, but somebody knew. So somebody in Congress knew it well enough to know that we were gonna need relief, and they started a bill back on January the 24th. By the way, January the 24th is also the same time that the Senate was getting a ultra-secret briefing about this, and our new Senator, Kelly Loeffler, all of a sudden started having some changes made to her investment strategy on Wall Street. January the 30th, the United Nations World Health Organization officially, uh, officially launches a worldwide public health emergency for what they called a novel coronavirus. 
Even though at that time there was only 150 cases in the world, nevertheless, they knew it was going to be an emergency. By the way, novel means newly discovered, means never seen before, uh, means COVID-19 didn't just come crawling out of the woods. Kind of makes you wonder, where did it come from? January the 31st, President Trump orders a travel ban on anyone traveling from China. Four days later, January the 4th, the Centers for Disease Control decided not to use the World Health Organization's COVID-19 test kits. They didn't think they were good enough, that we had to come up with our own. So CDC made their own test, and they were defective. Had to pull them all off the market. CDC got out some new tests by the end of February. But then there were backlogs, taking one to two weeks for people to find out whether they had it or not. By the way, you may not remember this about my resume, but before the Lord rearranged my life, I was planning on being a doctor. I was a pre-med major at the University of North Georgia, North Georgia College, majored in biology, minored in chemistry. So I went to the CDC website and looked at those test instructions, see what all was involved in doing a coronavirus test. And listen to this, this is a quote from the CDC website. A positive COVID-19 test does not rule out bacterial infections or co-infections with other viruses. Even COVID-19 may not even be the definite cause of the disease. Still, report all positive cases to CDC. Now, in layman terms, what that means is a patient may actually be sick with seasonal flu or pneumonia or PD, something else. A molecule of COVID-19 DNA in their swab of their throat or their nostrils then you're going to report that to CDC as a positive case. Well, one of the things that does for you is it definitely pumps up the numbers to make sure that everything that happens out there in the medical field is a COVID-19 case. Well, anyway, uh, the next day, February the 5th, Donald Trump was acquitted on the charges of impeachment. So all this time, we've been watching news about this impeachment, and we knew nothing about this COVID-19 thing that was going on out there in the world. So March the 11th, the um, World Health Organization officially declared the COVID-19 a global pandemic. March the 14th, the Associated Press announced that volunteers in Seattle were given the COVID-19 vaccine. Wait a minute. That was made by Moderna, wherever we heard that name before, and it was approved by Dr. Fauci's National Institutes of Health. And wait a minute, that's less than two months. I thought Dr. Fauci earlier said it takes at least 12 or 18 months to get a vaccine ready for trials. So something's going on there. Anyhow, March 15th, President Trump declares a state of emergency in the United States for COVID-19. And that's when we begin the social distancing, setting six feet apart, standing six feet apart, no, week, no meetings with over 10 people. On March 31st, Bill Gates wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post saying the United States missed the opportunity to get ahead of the coronavirus, so we need to shut down the U.S. economy for at least 10 weeks, which would take us to the end of June. And a week earlier, Bill Gates did a TED Talk interview where he said that once people of the world learn to trust science to solve a pandemic, maybe they'll be ready to trust science to solve climate change. And it kind of makes you wonder, where are we going with this thing? And so now we've moved on in our television narrative. Now the narrative is who done it? Where did this COVID-19 originate? Chinese leaders are saying that the United States military who attended the World Games in Wuhan released it as a bioweapon against China. American leaders are calling it the Wuhan virus and saying that the Chinese released it out of their virology lab in Wuhan in order to affect the world. The truth is probably up in there somewhere. But the trouble is, it's classified. And we will not know the truth for 40 years until it's declassified. And at that point, I will not care. Bottom line, this novel coronavirus, COVID-19, is a manufactured crisis designed to deceive people to accept a radically different world than you and I are used to living in. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't go out of here and misquote me. I'm not saying that people don't get sick with coronavirus. I'm not saying that they don't even die with it. The only thing I'm saying is according to the Centers for Disease Control who keep up with all these diseases, in an average year in the United States, there are 39 million cases of flu. 39, that's 10%. 39 
million cases of flu, and between 30 and 60,000 people die. And I've been living on this planet for 63 years now, and we have never shut down the U.S. economy over that big of a threat and that many deaths. But here we are, for some reason, the powers that be have chosen to shut down America over COVID-19, which we've already said they're cooking the books on it, but right now they've only got 70,000 cases against 39 million cases every year uh, between flu and COVID. And also today they've got it jacked up to 35,000 deaths, but still that's considered a low flu year. So once again, why did we shut down the economy? I believe we are being deceived and manipulated. And the question is, is why are we being deceived and where are we going with this? Well, according to the prophet Daniel and the apostle Paul, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. We're watching people who have been deceived by Satan because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and they're changing Christian customs, culture, traditions, and laws all across our land to prepare the way for a future Antichrist. I don't know if he's right around the corner. I don't know when the Antichrist will appear, but nevertheless, the stage is being set. And we've seen a lot of changes just in the last month. As Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago and former White House chief of staff under President Obama used to say, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And brothers and sisters, they're not wasting this one. We have watched our leaders transform this COVID-19 coronavirus from being just another virus into a crisis, into an epidemic, into a public health emergency, into a global pandemic. Now, I want you to stop because, again, we get caught up in the day-to-day, 24-hour news cycle. But stop and think about all the changes that we have accepted in about a month's period of time. We'll start off with the first thing they had to do, and that was to verify the power of the press. Make sure that those five corporations that control 90% of what we see and hear in the media still have the ability to put everybody in a panic. And of course, we're talking about CNN, Time Warner, ABC, Disney, Fox, News Corp, CBS, Viacom, NBC, Comcast. These networks bring on experts whose job it is to convince us that we need to give up our liberty or we're all going to die. They bring on globalist experts who explain that global problems require global solutions. I've heard that a half a dozen times, uh, sometimes daily. They tell us the world is too complicated for any nation, even something as great as the United Nations. We can't fix this by ourselves. We need a one world solution to our problems. They bring on experts who tell us that we need to quit being ignorant and listen to science, listen to the experts, listen to the technocrats. They alone know how to fix pandemics. They alone know how to fix climate change. Another one of the great changes that we've seen that I've never seen in my time is called social distancing. Six feet between individuals, no gatherings larger than 10 people, order people off the streets and confined to their homes. This is a trial run at martial law, but it turns out they never needed martial law because most Americans submitted voluntarily. But governors have ordered up police, deputized government workers, and deployed National Guard just in case we the people get sick and tired of this and rebel. And to further add to the rumors of a police state, our governor in Georgia set up a telephone hotline so you can call and rat out your neighbors who are not complying with lockdown orders. That sounds more like Russia or China than it does the United States of America. The next big change is crashing the capitalist economy. Following these social distancing guidelines, we have watched 22 million Americans lose their jobs. We've seen the stock market drop 10,000 points. We've seen our retirement savings vanish and go down the drain. We've watched the government take charge of the means of production, which is a classic definition of socialism. We've got the government using executive orders, loans, and grants in order to pick which businesses will win and which businesses will lose. Another big change that's come out of this is they've made the church irrelevant, or should I say more irrelevant than what we already were. In times past, when America went into a crisis, they would call the people of God to pray. That's not what we're hearing now. We're hearing we need doctors, we need scientists, we need people to tell us how to do this. We don't need God, we don't need churches in prayer. Churches are listed among non-essential businesses. Pastors are not allowed to visit sick members in hospitals or nursing homes. The Christian tradition of handshaking with the right hand of fellowship is forbidden. Churches are not allowed to assemble, which is a violation of our First Amendment right freedom of assembly and freedom of religion. 
Not to mention, it's also a violation of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, which says, Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Our sermons and our Sunday school classes are forced online, which means that all of our words are being saved and stored in the National Security Agency's new and huge data center in Utah, which as long as we have a government that's okay with Christianity is okay. But what if our new world government is more like China? Then our very own words will be used against us in a criminal trial. So NSA, if you're listening, there it is. And so now the government is offering free money to churches. Never mind the fact that using taxpayer money to prop up churches who are in debt is a violation of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. As our minister of music, Derek, often says, with the shekels comes the shackles. Whoever takes government money will ultimately take government regulations. And I don't think we want to do that at North Lake, at least not on my watch. Another change, cashless society. This is one of the globalist dreams and has been for years to get rid of cash, use digital currency to be able to monitor and control the flow of money around the world. Korea, which was one of the first nations outside of China to be infected with this disease, they pulled in all their cash to sanitize it because the World Health Organization said cash was just crawling with coronavirus. They required all their people to buy their things with credit cards and their iPhones. In the United States, Speaker Pelosi's first corona uh, relief ha house bill called for using digital dollars in order to give people their money that went out last week. Of course, you remember the Democrat house bill didn't pass, but the Republicans modified it, and they did pass a bill that didn't have digital dollars in it, uh, but we're already seeing pushing it through the IRS. There was all kinds of problems. We had money going to the wrong people, going to the wrong banks. Had some fireman, I think, here in Hall County got $7 million check last week. I mean, it, it, was, it was strange, I guess, just to prove that it's not going to work that way. So now we have a Senate uh, subcommittee on banking that's working on the details of how to give any future money to Americans in digital money instead of cash. Speaking of the government giving out money, one of the goals of this New World Order is universal basic income, where you get paid to do nothing. You don't have to work for money. The government decides what you need. I guess giving $1,200 to every adult and $500 to every child was a good test run. Interesting article in Bloomberg News on April the 5th. Spain is using the coronavirus crisis to roll out its universal basic income system. So apparently some of our nations know what's up with this. As Trump was signing in the $2 trillion re relief bill, he said that the final cost of all these programs will probably be $6 trillion. Now, brothers and sisters, this may sound good for us to be getting all this free money, but the thing you got to remember is no such thing as a free lunch. It will come due at some point. I believe by the time we get to the November elections, our national debt will be over $30 trillion. And just the interest on that debt will take up 15% of our federal budget. Think about that. 15% of your tax dollars will be going to empower international bankers who are holding our debt. Now, I could go on, but look at the hour. So let me conclude with another little notice change. This one happened around Christmas, in December the 23rd, 2019. Uh, the prestigious Scientific American magazine reported that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, had developed a biometric tattoo where a nanochip can be injected into your forearm at the same time you're being vaccinated. Therefore, your arm can be scanned to reveal your identity, your vaccinations, maybe even your medical records. The biometric tattoo program as part of a bigger plan called ID2020 that was also announced this January at the World Economic Forum in Davos, again sponsored by the Bill Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and several other billionaire organizations. These compassionate billionaires advertise this as being a special tool to help poor little children in undeveloped countries where in a crisis when there's a war or famine or something like that, they have to run to some other country and you don't know, they don't carry papers with them, so you don't know whether they've had their shots or not. So all they gotta do is scan their little forearm and know whether they've had their shots or not. Sounds very compassionate. But then you read on down the article, they also mentioned that these tattoos would be great screening tool for people at airports, border crossings, schools, healthcare facilities, government buildings, and sports facilities. 
I'm often asked, well, Brother Danny, well, what can we do about it? I mean, you, you know, you preach the sermon to scare us all to death, but well, what can we do about it? Are there some politicians that we can call to stop this thing? And the answer to that is, I don't think so, because I think this train left the station a long time ago. The real question is not what can we do. The real question is going to be what will you do? If this coronavirus makes its second or third wave around the world like the experts are predicting, and the Bill Gates vaccine is magically ready, and they offer you the vaccine, but in order to get the vaccine, you also have to receive the biometric tattoo. Will you take it? If not, you probably won't be able to go to work, or to school, or the grocery store, or to the bank. But later on, if we carry out this philosophy to Revelation chapter 13, when it's not just about a vaccine, but when you're required to swear allegiance and be willing to worship the exalted leader of the United Nations, or whatever the name is called at that point, to prove your loyalty to the UN, then you must take this biometric tattoo. And if you don't take it, then you won't be able to buy or sell or travel or get health care. What then? You're probably saying, Danny, I think this is a little extreme. I don't think this can happen. Sure, it can happen. It's happened before in history, even in some non-techie times. In ancient Rome, under the Roman Caesar Domitian, who happened to be in charge when John wrote the book of Revelation, he forced people to offer a sacrifice once a year of incense. It was just a little pinch. It wasn't much incense, just a little bit. All you had to do is pitch it into the fire and say, Caesar is Lord. That's it. And you're a good Roman citizen, and life goes merrily along. But that was a problem for some folks called Christians. They refused to take the pinch of incense and pitch it in the fire. And they refused to say, Caesar is Lord. Instead, they said, Jesus is Lord. And they and their families were thrown to the lions or given some other horrible punishment.